couple of remarks on the concept of magic, generally speaking, so cross-culturally, unlike ritual where we have an unequal relationship between mortals and the gods, magic serves to actively influence and steer the environment. So in other words, we are dealing with a manipulation or an attempt at manipulating the supernatural. In the case of Viking Age magic, uh, but again, I think this also applies cross-culturally, at least um, in comparison to to other um, pre-Christian cultures, this is not really separate from religion, which is why we're going to also delve a little bit into this concept of religion in the Viking Age, because magic was also a part of ritualistic practices. Religion in the Viking Age or religious um let's say systems, although that's not really a good term either, um, they were rather oriented in the, into the direction of practice, of rituals. They had no dogmas, they had no written holy textbooks. So ancient religious was, religions were rather in the realm of practice, of praxis. So neither religion nor magic as a component of religion can be regarded as very systemic, very structured, We would like to think so, but unfortunately, a lot of material and a lot of practices, rituals would have been um, lost. So we are only working with very limited uh, material. And we also need to remember that myths themselves are not really static. So if you think of the Viking world, you're thinking of a very, very large space with a lot of people and um, a lot of differentiation distinctions between these spaces. So there would have definitely been a lot of diversity with regard to what people believed in and especially with regard to um, how people expressed those beliefs. So in, uh, in ritual. And you do have a glimpse of that if you look at the multitude of supernatural beings that are referred to in the uh, sources we have left. Because besides the gods, we also have references to all kinds of beings populating this this universe from Dvergars or dwarves to Olvar, elves, and then you have the Dísir, some kind of feminine deities, the Nornir, the Fates, and so on and so forth. With regard to the physical aspects of Norse religion, here we also have a big problem. Um, This is very hard to retrieve archaeologically, I mean to identify archaeologically, because it seems that some of the secular architecture, so the large halls of the chieftains, would have also functioned as cult buildings. There have been attempts at dividing these buildings into um, larger buildings such as Hof or smaller buildings um, performing this function. But generally speaking, we do have this idea of the persistence of the supernatural in all aspects of daily life. So the political and the religious and the social were in this together. The worship required by the Norse gods was actually not based on adoration or even uh, unreserved approval, making it different from the Christian relationship with the divine. The nature of the Asir and the Vanir, these would be the the main families of gods, demanded only a recognition of their existence as an immutable part of human society and the natural world. And this recognition implied rightness and even a kind of beauty. So to avoid disaster, it was necessary to accept the gods on their own terms, not those of their followers. So this essentially means that the question of believing in the gods was not really that relevant. It is also pretty clear that Norse mythology was far from static. It varied both regionally and over time. It was also influenced by Christianity in different ways, depending on the geography and the period. And it might have also been influenced by some Mediterranean faiths and definitely influenced by the neighboring religions of the Sormi people. The Vikings also encountered the religious beliefs of Bolgs and Slavs and nomadic peoples from Western, uh, from the Western Asian steppe as well as from Islam. 
In the West, they met indigenous inhabitants from Greenland and Canada's eastern seaboard, though it's doubtful that this had some kind of influence. All in all, there were a lot of influences and some of them are really hard to discern whether they are native Norse or perhaps the result of this whole process of um, communicating and uh, mingling culturally with other peoples. The variations are very relevant in archaeology. They're evident here, both the material culture associated with spiritual beliefs, such as charms and amulets, and in burial practices. Burials show variation not only on a regional level, but almost from one community to the next, reflecting the very different ways on the proper way to send the dead from this world to the next. And importantly, the ceremonies for the dead were also a concern of the living. There were considerations about uh, status as well as a signal for political allegiance, for example. Discussions on Old Norse religion often focus on the higher beings like the Asir and the Vanir, and this overlooks a broader range of creatures that may have had a lot more significance for ordinary people. Some of these beings would have played a central role in the system of sorcery we're going to deal with. The structure of Nordic pre-Christian religion is more or less well documented regarding mythology and the gods and the roles they have within cosmology. So we do have a lot of studies in this area. However, there is less knowledge, considerably less knowledge about the physical aspects of this religion, including places of worship, these landscapes they were part of and the role of certain religious figures. We do have some idea about the Hov as a permanent religious structure and the Horger as a simpler natural site for worship, as uh, already discussed in the 60s. And ever since, there have been discoveries of sacred sites, but they can be more or less defined, such as the Ver sanctuaries, that might be linked to stone settings, for example, found under royal mounds in locations such as Jelling and Leire in Denmark. There have also been discoveries of so-called temples, although perhaps the term is not that accurate, such as those at Mere and in Gamla Uppsala, excavated in the 20s and then again revised in the 90s. And these discoveries implied the existence of a few major cult centers, often associated with the elite or with emerging kingdoms, surrounded by a network of smaller local sacred sites. However, the idea of cult continuity is something potentially problematic. <laughs> 